Jurassic Park is, in my opinion, a masterpiece of structure. And one of the reasons for that is because of how well it balances plot and character. There's basically no action until the midpoint in this story. It's all character up to that point. And it's just so beautifully and powerfully done that by the time we get to the midpoint and all the action, we are super invested in these characters and this dilemma that they find themselves in. Hi, and welcome back to Studio Binder. I'm Brandon. Today, we're speaking with award-winning and internationally published author, K.M. Wyland. K.M., would you like to introduce yourself? I'm K.M. Wyland, and I run the writing website, Helping Writers Become Authors, and have written books like Structuring Your Novel and Creating Character Arcs. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. Now, having written a book on story structure, could you tell us the function of structure and why it matters within a story? The way I teach story structure is pretty classical, um, but it particularly has to do with timing and dividing a story into eight equal parts. And this is to create turning points at those divisions that create the resonant psychological format of the story, as well as pacing. And in my view, this is what story structure is. Um, Obviously, story structure creates the overall arc of the story It guides people, writers, in being able to create plot and character arcs that are synced up and that can work harmoniously together beat by beat and create that emotional journey that readers and viewers want to experience um, in every story of every um, different genre and type. Wow. I mean, that sounds like a textbook definition, which just goes to show that you know what you're talking about. (laughs) Yeah, I I ran through it in practice this morning and I was dead on it. I'm like... I peak. I'm not going to get this good <laughs> afternoon. Now, in some circles, some people might say that structure can be limiting. Could you speak to whether you believe that to be true or not? So a lot of people feel that structure can be too limiting for a story or create a story that's formulaic. And this is actually the farthest thing from the truth. What structure does is provide a framework into which the story can then take many different forms but also specifically, it's a guideline for creating a resonant um, psychological transformation, because this is ultimately what story is. And so if you can understand kind of the skeleton underneath that, then you can create all kinds of stories on top of that. I particularly like the analogy of thinking of story structure as a gift box. So it's always a cube. It always you know, has wrapping paper and a bow and looks kind of the same, but What's inside of that gift can be anything. It could be a puppy or a video game or a cookbook. or So the possibilities are endless. It's just that you're building upon this framework that then makes sure you are able to connect with the audiences in a way that feels resonant because this is actually something that they experience in their own lives over and over again. I love the analogy of a gift. Uh, You know, whenever you watch a movie or you read a book that has a story that really sticks with you, it's almost as if you're being given a gift from that that author or director. Now, jumping into the three-act structure, you've broken it down into eight key moments. I wanted to run through those with you. Could you talk a bit about the hook and why it's so important to hook an audience right away? So the hook is the first beat in the story and therefore the first beat in story structure. And obviously the whole purpose of it is to hook your audience into the story and make them interested in what's happening. I like to think of the hook as the first domino in your story's row of dominoes. So even though it isn't necessarily immediately going to immerse your audience in the main conflict that they're going to experience later in the story, it is the first kind of string that gets pulled. The best way to do this, in my opinion, is to get them to ask a question whether implicitly or explicitly, you want them to be asking, hmm, what is that? What's that about? Or simply what's going to happen next so that they're interested enough to keep going. Now, your next key moment is the inciting incident or event. Could you talk to us a little bit about what that is? The inciting event happens halfway through the first act, so around the 12% mark. And this is the call to adventure, which is usually followed by the beat of the refusal of the call in some way. The inciting event is where your character first brushes up 
against the conflict. It isn't going to be a full-on immersion as we'll get later on in the story, but it's that moment where they first see it and they are given the option of whether to engage with it or not. Now, speaking of the first plot point, that is your next key moment. Could you take us through that? The first plot point is the bridge between the first act and the second act taking place a quarter of the way into the story around 25% mark. So this is a big moment in the story. This is the threshold of no return. Uh, so that even if the character wanted to go back at this point, which they won't in the story, because obviously we wouldn't have a story, but even if they did, they couldn't go back to the person they were. Something about the world or themselves or just their perspective of the world changes dramatically at this moment. This signals a full-on immersion in the conflict, so they're fully committed now. And they're after a specific plot goal, and they're facing opposition and that's bringing up obstacles. So from this moment on, they will be fully engaged with the conflict and will move forward through the story in a way that is focused on this end goal. Excellent. Now, your next key moment is the first pinch point. Could you define uh, what a pinch point is and uh, what this first one is meant to do within that story structure? The first pinch point takes place at the 37% mark within the story, which is halfway between the first plot point and the midpoint. Pinch points are primarily about emphasizing the antagonistic force and what is at stake for the protagonist within the story. These can be very subtle moments within the story, or they can be really big turning points. And they do need to be turning points that, that move the plot regardless. But they are specifically about showing what is at stake for these characters. What are they at this point in the story possibly going to lose if they continue on this course of action? It's also a really good time to check in with the antagonistic force, depending on what type of story you're telling and how you, the POVs are set up. But this can be a good way to show, even if the heroes are oblivious to what's going on, that the antagonistic force is in fact a threat and what's going on behind the scenes. Now, next up, you have the second plot point or the midpoint. Could you tell us a little bit about that? So the second plot point or the midpoint happens 50% of the way into the story and is, in my opinion, one of the most important moments in story structure. So director Sam Peckinpah referred to this as the centerpiece of the story off of which everything hangs. And I really like that because particularly if you're looking at story through a chiastic point of view, which is where the two sides kind of mirror each other, that midpoint is the fulcrum around which everything turns. So this is a big moment in any story. And everything that has led up to this is then going to turn and lead in a different direction heading toward the climax. In character arc terms, I always refer to this midpoint as the moment of truth, because this is a moment where the character's perspective on many things, but particularly the plot conflict, completely changes. Up to this point, they've been in maybe a sort of reactive phase, just simply in the fact that they're trying to find their feet. They're trying to understand where they're at within this new world, this new perspective that they find themselves in within the conflict. But the midpoint shows them what they're really up against, both within and without. And from that point on, using this information, even if the, the stakes are rising and the odds are stacking against them, now they are able to understand where they are within the scope of the conflict better and are therefore able to turn into a more active, proactive mode um, as they move through the conflict. Okay. All right, and next up you have the second pinch point. Could you tell us um, if there's a difference between the first pinch point and the second pinch point and uh, what that difference is and what this second pinch point is meant to do? The second pinch point happens around the 62% mark, which is halfway between the midpoint and the third plot point, which will begin the third act. The second pinch point, like the first pinch point, is also about emphasizing the antagonistic force and what is at stake for the characters. And particularly, it's about setting up what's going to happen at the third plot point, which will be uh, a false victory followed by a low moment. So this is, this is a moment when things are turning in the character's favor in some perspectives, perhaps, but also where the antagonistic force is doubling down, whatever that means within your story, on their pursuit of the goal and of defeating the protagonist. So it's a moment where the stakes are higher than ever, and it's a chance to emphasize what the characters really stand to lose if they continue down this path and are willing to risk it all once they enter the third act. You were giving us so much great information, so thank you. Uh, but next up, you have the third plot point. 
could you talk a bit about that? And uh, if there is a difference between the first, second, and third plot points, uh, could you touch on that as well? The third plot point begins the third act around the 75% mark. So the last quarter of the story is what we're now entering. And the third plot point as this bridge between the second act and the third act is one of one of the most important moments in the story. This is the beat that I like to refer to as the false victory followed by the low moment. And you'll sometimes also hear this referred to as the dark night of the soul or death rebirth. And this is a moment where the character takes everything they've learned in the second act and throws all their resources at their plot goal, at the antagonistic force and trying to overcome those last obstacles and reaches this false victory. And I call it false, but this doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't effective or that the character doesn't in fact experience some sort of a win here. What it does mean is that the cost is higher than they counted on and that the victory isn't the final push that's necessary to actually get through. No matter what type of story you're telling, whether it's a fluffy rom-com or a horror movie or an existential crime movie, this is the beat that really digs deep into the psychological resonance of character arc and transformation, which ultimately is what story structure is all about. Excellent. And then lastly, you have the climax and climactic event. Um, now, for those of us that might not know, uh, could you explain um, both and how they might differ from an one another? The climax begins officially halfway through the third act, around the 88 to 90 percent mark. And this is that final turn into the ultimate confrontation that the protagonist will have with the antagonistic force to decide the conflict, to decide whether or not the protagonist will be able to gain the goal that they've been pursuing throughout the story. And in some stories, they may gain it, and in some stories, they may not. But either way, it is definitively decided. This is the end of this arc, of this pursuit, of this goal. Now, in some stories, it can seem like the climax takes place throughout the entirety of the third act, and it is usually a ramping of intensity or tension in some way from the third plot point on. Regardless, there is always going to be this final turning point into the climax proper, which creates this final confrontation between protagonist and antagonistic force. So even if, say, you've had a major battle going on from the third plot point on, this is the moment where we turn that corner and the protagonist and the antagonist go mano a mano and just have that personal confrontation to decide the conflict. So the most important thing to understand about the climax is that it's going to funnel into this climactic moment, which is the definitive deciding point for the conflict that has been happening throughout the story. Okay, now that we've gone through all of these story structure beats, I'd like to apply those to Jurassic Park, which I know you're very enthusiastic about. Um, could you tell us why Jurassic Park is such a great example of story structure? Jurassic Park is, in my opinion, a masterpiece of structure. And one of the reasons for that is because of how well it balances plot and character. So when we think of this movie, we generally think of like a really full on intense action movie. But in fact, there's basically no action until the midpoint in this story. It's all character up to that point. And it's just so beautifully and powerfully done that by the time we get to the midpoint and all the action, we are super invested in these characters and this dilemma that they find themselves in. Absolutely. I totally agree. Now, what would you say the hook in Jurassic Park is? So the hook in Jurassic Park is interesting because particularly in light of the fact that the entire first half of the film is focused on character, the hook is about plot. It hooks us with the plot because that's what we're there for. And it does this in this fantastic scene in which the uh, one of the dinosaurs is arriving in a cage in the middle of the night to this mysterious location with a bunch of guys with tasers and guns who are clearly terrified. And it, get, it hooks us because it gets us to ask this question, what is that? What's in the cage? What's going on? And we know it's a dinosaur because we saw the, the poster and we saw the, the trailer for the movie. But the fact that it's keeping it a secret um, is something that is very effectively getting us to ask, what's really going on here? What don't we know? And that hooks us in so that it can then completely switch gears and move into much quieter character scenes for the next hour of the film. 
Now, I'm pretty sure I know what this is, but could you tell us what the inciting event in Jurassic Park is? The inciting event in Jurassic Park is quite literally a call to adventure. When uh, John Hammond arrives at um, Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler's archaeological dig and asks them if they want to come to his dinosaur theme park. And it's so beautifully and brilliantly done because not only is it a literal call to adventure, but there's an, an, an obvious and absolute refusal of the call too. When they both are like, no, we don't, we don't want to do this. We don't want to go. And then are promptly convinced otherwise by Hammond's bribe, basically. But this is the first moment when they brush up against what will be the main conflict in the story. And it's particularly beautiful because you can see how, unlike the first plot point, this is a choice. The inciting event is a choice. It is something that they could still walk away from and nothing changes in their lives versus the first plot point later on when everything changes. So the inciting event, once again, is something where the characters are brushed by the conflict, but aren't necessarily sucked completely into that. And we see that here in Jurassic Park. All right. Now, moving on from the inciting event, what is the first plot point? The first plot point in Jurassic Park is one of my favorite ever. So the first plot point is this threshold of no return in which the character leaves the normal world and enters the adventure world. And this is literally what happens in this movie. So not only do they leave their normal world of the dusty badlands in South Dakota and enter this beautiful rainforest that's filled with dinosaurs, but they literally move through a threshold. Like they have the gate of Jurassic Park that they literally move through that demarcates the difference in what they've just left behind and what they're now entering that is forever going to change them. And so the first plot point is this moment where not only do they enter the park, but they see the dinosaurs for the first time and they're just completely bowled over. This is one of my favorite moments in all of film, I think. And one of the reasons for that is just how honest it is because this is like literally how we would feel if we were confronted by this living miracle of a dinosaur suddenly being before us. Um, something that I think that Spielberg did a really good job of in this film is just maintaining that integrity of wonder that would be around this this venture if it were to be in real life, um, helped hugely, I believe, by one of John Williams' best scores. But aside from the fact that they're now in the park, they've now seen what will be the main conflict, the antagonistic force, basically. It's also interesting to note how they can't walk away from this, even if they, you know, figured out right away, like we don't want to be on this island with dinosaurs. This is a terrible idea. We're leaving now their lives are completely changed. Their perspectives are completely changed. So if they turn and walk away from this moment, it's still, nothing's ever going to be the same for them. That is the hallmark of a good first plot point. <laughs> Once again, your enthusiasm for this film, I, I think it's such a beloved film, uh, but people might not have had the chance to really walk through it beat by beat in a story structure since. And they might not know that, you know, the reason that they love this movie so much it has a lot to do with story structure. Uh, so I, I think once they've, they've seen this, they're just going to have um, a much greater love and understanding of the movie. So thank you for this again. <laughs> yeah, I love this movie. Now, next up, uh, what is the first pinch point in Jurassic Park? The first pinch point in Jurassic Park is very subtle, which pinch points often are. It still provides a turning point, but it is primarily an emphasis of the stakes. And in this case, that is particularly about the tropical storm that is coming down upon the island and that they're worried is going to interfere with the tour that Alan and Ellie and the kids are currently on. So most of this scene is just a simple little scene of dialogue down in the control center between Hammond and Mr. Arnold. It's not a big moment in the story, but A, it does emphasize the stakes. The storm is coming, and not only is that dangerous in itself in the moment, but it is what is going to create the catastrophe that we eventually see at the midpoint. And B, it is something that turns the plot in the moment, because this is the moment when they decide to bring the Jeeps back or try to bring them back to the visitor center. All right. Now, next up is the midpoint. Yay! <laughs> well, I'm excited to hear your answer now. <laughs> so the midpoint in Jurassic Park is possibly my all-time favorite midpoint in film. This is a master course in what a midpoint should be. 
So as I said, the story up until this point has been pretty much focused on character. But at this point, everything changes. And when the T-Rex bursts out, we suddenly come face to face with what this conflict has really been about all along. So up until this point in the story, the characters have been relatively reactive. Uh, the scientists have all been opposed to what's going on in the park, but they haven't been in like an active resistance mode. But after this point, they don't have a choice and they have to full on go into proactive survival mode and oppose this antagonistic force of the dinosaurs that's coming at them. This is an amazing scene because I think when anybody thinks of Jurassic Park, this is the scene they think of. They think of the T-Rex there. And so that shows how important it is to create something that's iconic, something that's really big, and something that massively turns the plot at this point. All right. Now, moving on from the midpoint, what is the second pinch point? The second pinch point in Jurassic Park, like the first pinch point, is relatively subtle. Um, but again, it's very interesting in how it uses its effect to turn the plot and to emphasize the stakes and to show what the antagonistic force is up to. So in this story, the second pinch point is Dennis Nedry's death. And Dennis Nedry, even though he's a bad guy, has pretty much been a supporting character, a minor character throughout the story. And yet his death is very significant within the story because not only does it emphasize the full power of the antagonistic force of the dinosaurs when he's killed um, and therefore foreshadow what could potentially happen to the characters that we actually like and want to survive. But it's also important in that without Dennis Nedry, the Mr. Arnold and John Hammond have no hopes of getting the park back online. Um, part of this moment is the moment where, where Mr. Arnold looks at Mr. Hammond and says, I can't get Jurassic Park back online without Dennis Nedry. So when Nedry dies in this horrific way, even though it's a subtle moment about a supporting character, it's thematically pinch perfect and it completely amps everything up as we funnel into the third act. All right, now moving right along, uh, what is the third plot point in Jurassic Park? Once again, the third plot point in Jurassic Park perfectly illustrates what this structural beat is supposed to do. So we have the false victory, which is when Ellie is able to cross the compound and turn the electricity back on in the park, which is a huge win for everyone who's still trapped there. But this is immediately followed by the low moment. And this is really well cross cut between the characters' storylines. So not only does Ellie turning on the power um, affect Alan and the kids who are off separately from her in their storyline when Tim is climbing the fence and is electrocuted as a result, but Ellie is also immediately confronted by the true antagonists in this story, which are the very intelligent raptors. So there's this great moment where she's, you know, literally celebrating her victory and saying, Mr. Hammond, I think we're back in business. And then she's screaming because the raptors are, are there and are coming at her. And one of my favorite moments in that scene as well is when she's she's running away and all of a sudden there's this this comforting hand on her shoulder and she thinks it's Mr. Arnold who's who went ahead of her and it's this severed arm. So you have this really nice emphasis and this melding of the characters making progress toward their goal. They're like really reaching out toward this 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 false victory. But they're also confronted by the true weight of what they're up against and and really the fact that they're closer to death than they ever have been at this point. All right. And next up, what is the climax? So the climax in Jurassic Park, as it is in many action stories, is a continuation of the full on action that we've been seeing since the third plot point. However, it does a brilliant job of doing what climaxes need to do, which is funneling all that conflict and action down to its narrowest point. And Jurassic Park does this really well visually because it's just, the settings just keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So for most of the second act, we've been out in this huge park, and then we narrowed it down and we're in the visitor center in the third act. And now as the climax began, it just we're in the hallways, and then we're in this tiny little control center in the basement of the, of the visitor center. So this is a really good way to narrow in a climax, even in a story where you've got tons of action already happening, tons of excitement and violence and, and tension, so that when there is no escaping and the characters are forced into close proximity with the antagonistic force and the conflict has to be decided one way or the other for once and for all. All right. And finally, what would you say the climactic moment or event in Jurassic Park is? 
The climactic moment in Jurassic Park is when the conflict is fully decided. And in this case, the characters are able to escape the dinosaurs in what is really one of the most beautiful and poetic climactic moments um, that could have been imagined for this movie. And that's when the T-Rex comes in and saves them. But really, it's this, this emphasis, again, of this the chaos of nature that has been the theme of throughout the movie. So they're able to escape. And then there's what is, in many ways, the true climactic moment of the movie, when the overarching conflict that has been happening over the entire course of the movie is decided, when Alan tells John Hammond, I've decided not to endorse your park. Now, I wanted to get your opinion. Uh, in previous videos, we've labeled that T-Rex moment as a deus ex machina. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I would say it's technically that, but in my opinion, the difference is that um, it's set up so well, um, particularly thematically. I mean, I mean, if we didn't have the T-Rex come back in, in some ways, that's a loose end. Um, so I think because of the the way the theme is set up, that it does become this moment where it's sort of a commentary on itself that works in a way that it wouldn't necessarily in a different sort of movie. That's my opinion. That's a, that's a great answer. <laughs> um, yes, uh, but yes, thank you so much for everything today. It's been wonderful speaking with you. Yeah, no, I'm excited to see how it turns out. I, I have no expectations. I'm just, um, it's just cool to be a part of it, and I'm excited to see how it turns out. Be sure to check out Cam's website at helpingwritersbecomeauthors.com to learn everything you need to know on becoming a better writer, author, etc. And for more interviews and deep dives into the Studio Binder software, be sure to like and subscribe to be notified whenever new videos are added. Again, I'm Brandon with Studio Binder. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. <laughs>